Awesome. Well, big ups to uh, Hint and everybody for uh, you know putting this together. It's always very exciting. Um, so uh, just a quick around the room. How many people here are JavaScript users or programmers? Awesome. How many people here uh, are aware or even use JavaScript in a functional programming type of way? Yeah. <laughs> of those people, how many people uh, know the difference between imperative JavaScript functionally and declarative JavaScript? All right, good. We got to a point. Um, so that's great. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about another kind of branch of this tonight uh, called algebraic JavaScript. And it's, there's a lot of parallels between programming and that algebra that we learned in 7th or 8th or where, whenever you learned algebra, there's a lot of parallels between that. And there's been a lot of work mathematically to kind of put together a relationship between mathematics and programming. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Ian Hoffman Hicks. Uh, you can see me everywhere on the internet as Evilsoft, uh, GitHub's, all the things. I work for a company called Articulate. We make e-learning software. It's a 100% remote company. About 174 of us do this all over the world. And uh, I get the chance to have 100% autonomy with my team on how we solve the problems that our business needs. So about four years ago, we decided, you know, I'm getting really tired of these event loops and getting caught in these stack flow overflows and all this crap that comes along with backbone apps and things like that that we were doing. So we decided to kind of explore what functional JavaScript could get us. And uh, we started that about four years ago and it kind of rippled out through all of the project teams and pretty much the whole company if they use JavaScript is doing it functionally. So a little bit about me. Obviously, I use functional JavaScript. I'm a Vim user, two spaces over tabs, and no semicolons. So if that makes you cringe, I'm sorry. Um, you can also see me in all these places. Uh, so I'm on GitHub, Twitter, the YouTubes, and uh, I have a couple lessons on Egghead. All is evil soft in all those locations. So before we get started, we're going to do a little housekeeping. And if you haven't seen this movie, House Party, with Kid and Play from the early 90s, I really recommend seeing it. It's one of the best hip hop movies that was ever created. So we'll get into this. Uh, we'll talk about sets of things. So this may not, I don't know how much finite mathematics you've all have done, but uh, we'll kind of just go over it briefly and show some connections. So in our universe, we have things. And as humans, we like to give things labels. It just makes it easier to talk about it, point at it, and describe stuff by giving it a label. So here I'm not very creative. We're just going to use lowercase alphas. Uh, it's going to be super easy. But also, we like to look for certain properties inside of things. Uh, it also helps us describe and talk about those. So here, how's that coming through? Good. I was worried about the color choice. Um, on a, but we're not doing a projector, so it works out great. Um, so we like to give certain things attributes. And once they have these attributes, we also, as humans, like to kind of categorize them and put them together. So certain things that have certain attributes, we can go ahead and just put them together and talk about them as a whole and the relationships that they have to each other. Um, that's a horrible way of saying that. Now, the properties that they share. So, and also, we like to give these categories names. Again, not very creative, so we're just going to go A, B, and C for these. One of the things you might notice, though, and this is kind of convention in set theory, a lot of the sets have uh, uh, capital uh, names, either that or some sort of symbol, uh, script symbol, and usually the elements are lowercase. Just a matter of convention. So again, uh, one of the things we can do with these is, uh, or some of the properties of sets are I can pick any one of these elements at any point, and I did, there's no structure to them. So I don't need to iterate over like going through the alphabet, A, D, E, G, to finally get to K. I can just pick K right out. There's no structure or anything to these. And if I were to pick K again, K will always be equal to K. But if I compare K to something else, it's not K. And if anything else that I pick out of there is equal to K, that thing has to be K. Very important. Um, 
So again, what the heck does this have to do about JavaScript? So we'll kind of clear the board here and we'll give them some more familiar type of things. We'll pick uh, any JavaScript value, just a value that could be used in JavaScript. Uh, and it's, uh, it's not a strictly type language, so you can use these at any point in time in your code. No need to say this is this, this is that. But you'll notice a lot of these have similarities and things in common. Some of them are strings, numbers, a boolean, and even null. Um, null is really its own type that has one element in it. Another thing like that is undefined. Undefined is also a type that only has one element in it. A lot of people think it's nothing, but it's not nothing, it's something. You can't have nothing in programming, no matter what they say. So to look at uh, some of these similarities between sets and what we know of as types, if I were to pick out an A, say its number, I can take 42 and assign it to a value. I didn't have to count from zero to get up to 42. I just instantiated by giving it a value. And if I were to pick 42 again, uh, sorry, let me back up. Also, if I were to pick A, it's reflexive. So A will always be equal to A. We take that for granted, but it's a really neat thing that A is always equal to A. It gives us a lot of, uh, how would you say, guarantees in life. If A was never equal to A, a lot of things would break down. Um, also, if we were to pick it again and assign it to another variable, even though it's another instance of that, it is always by value going to be equal to A again. And it's symmetric. So A is equal to B and B is equal to A. So there's that symmetry there on top of it. That's another thing that you would see in, in normal sets. And if I were to pick anything else, that is not going to be equal to A. And if A is equal to B, C is also not going to be equal to A. These are all things we take for granted, but it's these type sorts of things that show the similarities between set theory and actual programming that we do day to day. So a lot of this that we're going to discuss, those little bit diagrams don't, or dot diagrams don't tell much. So we're going to use a convention of diagramming that's used in a branch of mathematics called category theory. So in here, we're going to represent any type as a lowercase letter. So this A could be any type. I'm saying for any type, string, number, whatever. Anytime you see a lowercase, it usually means any type. And then also B. B could be equal to A. It could be the same type, but it doesn't have to be. It gets a little confusing, but don't worry about it. We'll get there. So we like to represent relationships between types with these arrows. And for us in JavaScript, these arrows represent functions. So to kind of see what that looks like, say we were to have an arrow, f, that goes from string to number. So it's just a function, right? I give it a string, and it's going to give me back a number. Also, that uh, notation there is uh, a fun little notation to learn more on that later. So we'll just pick that arbitrary f, and we'll give it a name. And of course, there's a great function called length that would take a string and then return the length of it. As you see, I put in a string that is nice, and it returns me back a 4. So in this way, there's directionality. I've moved from a value inside of string into a value of number. And this happens for anything that's typed like that, or any, any sort of function. So now that we know diagrams, we can talk about the most important found or the foundation of functional programming, and that's function composition. The only thing that's even more important to that is a thing called identity, but we won't get into that. Basically, it's just something you give it it, and it gives you that thing back. But we have to have that, and we have to have composition in order for all of this to work. So what composition is, is if I were to take any type B to any type or any type A to any type B, and I have a function f, any, type, any function of that type that moves between there, and I have a function from B to C, I should always be able to create what's called a composition. And that we typically note that as a G composed with F, or this could be read G after F. It's just a way to uh, keep track of that. Now, that's all very abstract, uh, so let's, oh. Actually, we're not at that part. I added this part this morning. Huh. So the only way we could really do that is if we were to take some value x that's an a and then pass it to f, and then that goes to g, giving us the result. Now, we run into this a lot. If you go look through your code, you'll see this throughout your code if you're not already doing functional composition. 
Um, so we could even create a new function that's g after f that just takes a value of x, and uh, now we have a function that is the composition of f and g. But we can even make it more generic by making a really simple function that takes a function g, takes a function f, then takes that value x, and then applies the composition. So now I can pass in any function g and any function x, and as long, or f, and as long as their types match up, I have a valid composition. And again, we'll run into this a lot. This is the foundation of functional programming. So let's move that into JavaScript and see kind of like how this plays down, or plays out. So we'll start with an object, a string, and a number as our types. We'll create a function called user that goes from object to string. Now on this, all we're going to do is take an object, pull the user off of it, and then return that user. Does everyone use arrow functions a lot? Does this, you read this? Cool. Um, so we're going to, uh, that will get us, uh, and we're assuming here that user's always going to be a string. Uh, remember, it's JavaScript. But we're going to say that we're good programmers, and we'll always make sure that we pass an object to this. And it'll always be a string. Um, also, I can then take a length, that same function, um, and, uh, or I can take a length function that does the same exact thing. I give it a string. Well, string has length property on it. I can just pull that off and return it. So now I have a function that uh, goes from string to number. And then I can combine these into one super mega function called user length, which now goes from object to number. Uh, and using that little function, the compose that we made earlier, I can just pass in length, pass in user, and I have a function that when I pass in a user of Edna, it gives me back four. So that's functional composition in a nutshell. There's one more aspect to it that I didn't really mention. Um, and it's really funny. You'll hear a lot of people say, your functions have to be pure. Your functions have to be pure. And then they give you this big old tutorial on why your functions have to be pure and referential transparency. The only reason your functions have to be pure is because your diagrams have to commute. And all the diagrams we'll be showing here are what are called commutative diagrams. So what I mean by commute is if I were to take the path from f to g and I were to take the path from g to f, whatever I start at in a, I always, always must return the same c. So to see what that looks like, we'll go back to our example. If I were to take the user billy and send it on this path from user to length, I have to map that to 5. It will always map to 5. And the, with this composition, that always has to map to 5, no matter what. And that has to happen for every object that goes to any of these functions. And that's why your functions have to be pure. Because if your functions aren't pure, then they're not going to commute. And I, if I run user length at a different time than user and there's a side effect in there, this diagram won't commute and all of it breaks down. So this is why it's very important to always have pure functions. And we can see here, to test this, if we just take the, uh, the x, pass it to user, and then pass the result of that to length, it must always equal the user length. But we know that's the case because that's how you make composition. So as long as your functions are pure, you're always going to commute. Um, so that's it for the uh, wrap up, or for the, uh, how would you say, the housekeeping. Um, so now let's get to the algebra. And don't worry, uh, I just really wanted to put that stuff in your head so it'll make it easier for the rest of this. Then you can say like, oh, that's composition. Oh, that's that. All right, so on to the algebra. So what the heck does JavaScript have to do with algebra? Well, we can look at a comparison uh, for each operation in arithmetic, algebra, and JavaScript in the way that we're thinking about it. So there are uh, three main operations with their inverses. JavaScript, we cannot do the inverse operations because we're not a compliant ring. And if you didn't take abstract algebra, you probably have no idea what a ring is, but that's OK. We're not going to talk about them. Just something to keep in the back of your mind. We're not a ring. So if you look at addition, the operation on that uh, in arithmetic, that would just be a simple two or 20 plus 2. So that gets you 22. In algebra, 
we do an A plus B, and each one of those could be terms. It's basically the addition of terms. But in JavaScript, we have the same. The only difference is these aren't variables. These are types. So we're basically adding two types together whenever we do this. Um, and if you remember set theory, uh, kind of think of it as a union of sets. But it's a special uni union of sets. And the reason why it's special is because it's actually based off multiplication. That's why it's a little bit different than just a simple union. So in multiplication, we use the cross operator, or the x, to uh, between our values to multiply them together. In algebra, we have the dot, or sometimes we just put them together for scaling and things like that. But in algebra, we actually multiply two types together. So try to think, what the heck could that mean, multiply two types together? Now, we're only going to cover these two. Um, there's also exponential uh, operations. So in arithmetic, that would be you know uh, 5 to the second, or 5 squared. In algebra, we'd have a to b. And in JavaScript, we also have a to b. But the difference here is, and that's backwards, um, it should actually be b to a. Sorry about that. Um, it's a function. So it's basically what's called a function type. So it's a type that wraps a function. We don't need to get into that for our examples today, but just know that there is exponentiation. All right, so we're going to start with product types because some types, or the, the pluses, uh, the addition portion of it, it uh, pretty much comes from a product type. So going to our diagrams, we would represent a cross b as uh, the type. And then we have these two projection functions. That's why it says pi, p for projection. Um, and you'll notice in a lot of category theory and abstract algebra, they like Greek for some reason. Don't know why, but they do. So you'll see it all over the place. But a type or a product type it has the property of having two um, projection functions. And what that does is on the left side of it, it can take that type, the, um, the product, and pull out the left side. And it can also take the right side, or the b of the product, and if you pass it to pi 2, that's going to take out the b side of it. So I can remove it from its context. Um, now, you probably have used these a lot. If you think about uh, like screen positioning, you have an x and a y coordinate. That's what this is. It's basically just a pair, right? So we would have whatever our y coordinate is, whatever our x coordinate is, and then from there, we can move them individually. They're independent of each other. So I can move the width, and that doesn't affect the height. Or I can move it on the x, and it doesn't affect the y. Um, I could implement rules to say, hey, when it gets to the end of this, go ahead and increment the y. But I don't have to do that. They live fully independent of each other. And that's the actual property that we're going to exploit tonight, is that independence. Um, so to see what this looks like in JavaScript, we'll go ahead and uh, use a pair. So if I were to have a pair of number and bool, I could instantiate it like this. Now, we're going to be using a library called Crocs, which is a library that implements algebraic data types and has all of this stuff available. So in that library, there is a type called pair. So I can instantiate a pair P. And on the left side, I'll go ahead and put 42 on it. And on the right side, I'll just put true. So now this matches our SIGI of, num of number bool. So our projection functions are actually FST, which stands for first, and SND, which stands for uh, second. So for first, if I were to run first on that P, I would pull out 42. If I were to run second on that, I would, of course, get true. If that was false or whatever, I would just pull it out. So these functions come equipped with pair. Real simple, but uh, it's, it's mostly the independence that we care about, the fact that these two things exist side by side. And as a matter of fact, you can think of a product as having this and that to tie it into Boolean logic, which is another branch of finite mathematics. But this also translates into Boolean logic as well. Um, all of this stuff is related. But you can think of it having a num and a bool. They exist at the same time, no matter what. So from that, we can create some types. Now, in category theory, we have these things called co. So if we were to put a 
if we were to preface, co preface? preface, preface, thank you. If we were to preface uh, co to anything, it gives it the opposite. And what that means is we flip the arrows. So for instance, if you eat cocoa puffs, you're really just eating puffs. Right? No, no? Okay. Um, so uh, anyway, sorry. Again, we like our Greek. So, and if you look here, we took those projections and the only thing we did is inverted them. So uh, now instead of pointing out and projecting out, they actually inject in. And that's why we use IOTA for the actual injection functions. Again, with the Greek, I don't know why. And we're gonna have one on the left, which is L1, and then one on the, or IOTA1, and then one on the right, which is IOTA2. So what this looks like um, in JavaScript using the Crocs library is we have a type called either, which is the canonical type for uh, a, pro a uh, sum type in anywhere. Uh, but basically, it has a number on the left and a Boolean on the right. But the difference here is we have to construct into it. So remember, with the projection or with the uh, uh, product types, we're extracting. So we're projecting out. With these, we have to inject in. So we do that with a number of constructors. One, if we want it to be on the left side, uh, we would use left and we would pass that a number and then one for the right side, which would give us the right side, which in this case, would uh, we want it to be a bool. And again, if I pass this in, I now get an instance of either, which is a left instance that has 42 on it. And also on the right side, I have a right, if I were to construct it using right, I would get back an instance that wraps that Boolean, but it's been tagged with right. And that's the major difference here between a set union and what we're working with here is this is called a tagged union. So even if it was number and number, I would know is that a left number or a right number and I could respond accordingly uh, based on any information we wanna give it or any reason for it being left or it being right. Um, so that's, that's the main difference there. So while we could think of product as this and that, we could think of some types as this or that. There will only ever be one instance here. We can't have a left and a right. We can only have a left or a right, which is pretty neat. But you'll notice it's just by shifting those arrows, we get a whole new type that behaves in a whole different way um, that we can, we can utilize. And you run into that a lot in uh, category theory and abstract algebra. So we're done with the theory. That's it. I promise there'll be no more diagrams. There's not gonna be any more talk of algebra. We're gonna get to the code. So if you want, you could take a wee stretch, get it out of your head, and forget all this stuff. Doesn't matter. So we'll move on. All right. Now let's take all of this theory and let's do some code. So these are our requirements. Uh, I always thought a good project man, I took it out, but I always think Chad is a great project manager, right? Like, don't you just wanna take work from someone named Chad? But I was like, eh, it's weird, so I just took the quote out. Um, but Chad says that given an unsanitized list of learner records, we wanna provide a list of string learner names with a length greater than three that uh, passes with a score of 70% or higher. Can you tell I work for an e-learning company? So just by looking at these, uh, now, me personally, when I was doing this internal or uh, imperative development and stuff and object-oriented stuff most of my life up until about four years ago, I would really just see this as two things. All right, we need to filter invalid records and we need to transform each record into a learner name. Like, that's what I glean from this. I'm like, these are my requirements. So taking those as our requirements, and uh, working on our data, we see what he means now by um, unsanitized. So this is JavaScript and our data could come from anywhere. So we were hoping that we would have a list of record types, but we got all these nulls in there and we got like 22, what the heck is that? Learner's not even a string, it's a null. Like no one knows where this is coming from. So we're gonna have to, as we build these applications, account for that because we don't like to sanitize our data. It's probably too expensive anyway. It's coming from many sources, right? So 
this is what our main logic will look like. We're just going to have a simple function that checks to see, is it valid? And uh, we just take in a rec, and because the data is not sanitized, there's a lot of silly little JavaScript things that we have to do. So we'll basically just check to see, hey, is it a record? Is it, is it a positive value? This way we're not processing any things with nulls or undefines that are going to throw errors once we start grabbing on their properties. Um, and then we have a couple helpers like is string, and basically this is just a function to check to see if a value is string. And then on top of that, we're going to check to see, all right, it's a string, so what's the length of that string? If it's greater than three, we're good to go, and we can move on. Now we're also going to check in this same function, is this uh, a number for our score? Like, we can't really do a relational comparison. Um, yeah, it's still valid. We can't do a relational comparison on this if uh, it's not a number because we're comparing it to a number. And we don't want to get into some weird coercion magic and things like that. So we want to check that firsthand uh, before we have some hard to find bugs. So that's basically what we're going to do to see if it's invalid. Um, the other thing we need to do is transform this record based on our stuff. So we have these simple functions. Uh, basically, that's going to also check to see if rec is a string, even though we already did that. Then it's going, or is valid. Then we're going to check to see if learner's a string. If it is, we're going to return the learner. Otherwise, we're going to return unknown. But the way we're going to lay this out, we'll probably ever, never, never hit that unknown value. So with those two requirements, you might be thinking, hey, I read Gitify's book, and he knows everything about functional programming. So we're going to do this functional program. And this is an example of what I call imperative functional programming. Um, notice we're creating variables. We're doing things. We're manually putting together this, calling this after that. Anyway, so what we would do is filter this on is valid. And then after that, we just map in our transition. Boom, we're done, right? But this is a little disgusting. Does anyone know why I'm using such vulgar language and calling this disgusting? Is it evident? So we have multiple iterations over this structure. Yeah, we saw that we were only going over six things. But what happens if we get 10,000 things? Um, and what if all 10,000 of those things are valid? So while we're looping over it to filter them out, we're now also going to have to loop over it to map them and do our transformation. So even though it did match our requirements, there's a little gotcha there that uh, you'll run into as soon as you get successful and have a lot more than just five learner records. So we could take the old school's route, and we'll just use imperative for loops. So the issue with this, in my opinion, one of the issues, is uh, we have to create this accumulator. And that accumulator is outside of our iteration. So if we wanted to change this and use it somewhere else or something like that, all of that information has to transport to that new thing. So we have to create an accumulator. That accumulator has to be the same name that's used inside of our function. So there's really no easy way to extend this. Um, using an imperative thing. And you end up with a bunch of these little functions, depending on your model, all over your code where you're doing one thing but just changing something slightly. But you have to copy pasta that stuff all over, which is a great emoji. Just do policeman spaghetti, and that means copy pasta. Right? So let's go to functionally imperative. Now, I see this all the time, and this is bad. I don't know why people do this. So they're thinking, you know what? I'm not using a for loop anymore. I'm just going to use for each. But you notice the same problem with that for loop is here. The only difference is we didn't have to create a variable called rec. If we were to look here, see we had to actually const that rec. The only difference between this code and that code uh, is the fact that we don't have to create that variable. We'll get it in as the function. But this has the same problems. So much boilerplate. And this is one of the problems I have with imperative programming is, and you don't really think about it, but if we look at these, we have is valid and get learner. That's our business logic. Like that is the logic that was given to us by our uh, project manager, whatever, business analyst, whatever we use. So every single one of these examples do the same thing. The only difference is, how do we put together 
the calls to implement our two business requirements that we have. And all of this is boilerplate. We would have to move this over to something else. Uh, uh, we always have to put this in uh, anytime we're writing any type of imperative code. Think of all the if statements that you've written that are exactly the same, but one variable name has changed. It's all boilerplate. And how many people have said, oh my gosh, I love this library. I, have to, I get to write all this boilerplate to get it set up. <laughs> Nobody, right? But yet we do this day in and day out with our imperative code. All we do is just write boilerplate. And we don't even really stop to think about it. And the only difference is, it's just how do we put these two business requirements together? That's, that's the only thing that we really need to solve as developers. So what we're going to try to do is put together or see if we can take those little tidbits of algebra that we learned a little bit ago that I told you to forget all about and see if we can create this, um, see if we can use this to solve those problems that I had. Now, one of the major problems is our requirements, we took them very holistically. So if you think about them, there was only two things, filter, transform. But there's actually a lot more if you were to break the statement down. So first of all, we, one of the things you may have noticed is in that validate function, we're validating score and we were validating whether or not that username was right. So that one function had to be aware of two different properties that could or could not be on there, be on that object. And then on top of that, how do we, um, or it would have to know how that should behave or what we consider valid for each of those. So we've really put two concerns, or as I like to say in emoji, corn cerns together, and that's emoji corn dash cern. Um, so, and uh, I can't really fault anyone for thinking that because that's how we solve these problems, right? As imperative or programmers, we look at the problem as a whole and then we start pressing it out. Like how many times have you, you know, designed a game and you built your whole like game structure first instead of working on how do I put one pixel on the screen? No, you spend hours building the stupid game engine and then you never ever get to put in a pixel on the screen because you view it holistically. So. Whenever we uh, kind of do functional programming, we kind of invert that. So we never think of anything holistically. We think about it at the smallest level and build up from there. So it's just a different way of thinking from object-oriented or structured code. Um, so using the, hold on. OK, I say all that, and then I do this. So using that in a frame of mind, or in that frame of mind, we can break this out to other requirements, like validate the score extract a learner, validate that learner, and then filter valid records. And really that's it, so that'll, that'll take care of it. Instead of two things, we're gonna look at this at four things, and we're gonna break it down to the smallest level. So, with that, we're going to do a little, is that, can, can you all read that? Yeah. Yeah. The color's all right? Good. Font size, okay. All right, so what we're gonna do is just build this out, but we're going to tackle it one little bit at a time. So over on our right, we have that data that you saw earlier. And then on the left here, these are all the functions that we're gonna bring in to kind of help us put this together. Uh, no need to really worry about those yet. I'll explain each of them as we go to implement them. So since we're starting with the score, right? Yeah. So let's validate the score first. Now remember, I like to think, or when you think of these things, you want to go at the, the smallest unit possible. So instead of thinking about a score that's on an object, we're gonna just think about a number. We don't care if it's on an object, we don't care about things like that. We'll implement how do we validate this just as a number, and then we'll start building up from there. So here for valid score, this is really pretty simple, I guess. Um, we need to check to see, uh, oh, also, I'm sorry, let me back up. We also have this greater than or equal to function. So you may not, I don't know if you could see that, but it's a uh, curried function. Uh, we're gonna take an A and then we're gonna take a B and then we're gonna see if B is greater than or equal to A. So when you see this laid out, it'll actually read really, really nice. Right now it's probably like, whoa, those are kind of flipped and strange, but 
when we go to actually use this thing, it'll read kind of like English, um, which makes it real easy to uh, figure out what's going on there. So what we're going to do here is we want to take a number, and we want to take that number to be score. And uh, we're going to use a function on this called and score. Yeah, I think that's right. We're going to use a function on here called and. And what and does is it takes two predicate functions. Everyone here know what a predicate function is? It's a function that takes something, returns a Boolean. Um, it basically tells you yes or no. Um, so what we're going to do, this uh, and function takes two Boolean functions. And then it's going to take a value. And it's going to pass that value to each of the functions and then do an and on them. So we'll have one function that goes in, gets tested twice, and if it both passes is true, it'll return true. If one of them fails, it fails. So just to see what that looks like, we'll do uh, and is number, and uh, what's another good one? Uh, we'll use our greater than or equal to, and here we'll say 70. Oops. OK, and you'll notice from the uh, signature there, this is going to take in a number and return a function that takes an A to a Boolean. So now we're going to return this function. I feel like I'm missing something here. What am I missing? Didn't you figure out the task in the store also to hand the two functions and also the thing that you're testing? What was that? Yeah, so and that's what we're doing is we're leaving that third thing off. So that way, it's going to be a function that's ready to take that last thing. So now I can put it in a map. I can put it in anything. And it's now a function that's going to run that over any value that we pass it. So we get a new function. I think I'm missing a thing here. So if we were to come down here and check to see. We'll do valid score. And if we pass in, uh, let's see. Thank you. That's what I was doing wrong. Didn't look right. OK, so if I were to pass in a valid score of 70, so here we're going to say 70 is the valid score. And then I go ahead and pass in, oh, what's a good thing to pass in? Oh, one thing we don't need is that, because that's just silly. Uh, we'll pass in 60. So we see that returns false. Um, if I were to pass in a string of 60, that also returns false, because it's not a number. But if I were to pass in, what is going on? I am. Yeah. So ridiculous. Um, so if I were to pass in anything like undefined, like say I want to pass in undefined, it's not going to fail. It's just going to say false because undefined is not a number. And if I were to pass in oh, 78, it returns true. So now we have a neat function that's going to validate score. But remember earlier when I was talking about composition and how, uh, you know, remember what it looked like? It's kind of hard to see it here. But this function here, that's the last one, um, is actually, that would be the f in that example. And this one here would be the g. Um, so, and this right here would be the x, right? So because we know how composition works, we can actually make this point free and get rid of the um, score and bringing that score in. Just, are you kidding me right now? No, I'm not kidding you. Oh, your keyboard. It is my keyboard, but I refuse. All right. So I can do the is number, and we close that out. And here I can do greater than or equal to, and get rid of that. And now I have a function that is ready to accept score, or a score. And then it's going to populate the first attribute of that great or the first parameter of that greater than equal to and then that function is going to go into the second function of that other one and it's going to give me back the function. 
So it's the same exact code that we wrote. The only difference is it returns a function. Why is that? That's a good question, man. Hmm. Well, isn't that just a silly little? Oh, because we need to pass a thing. It is a function. So now if we do 78 or 79, that'll be true, but a string 79, of course, will be false. So it's the same exact function. The only difference here is we got rid of having to declare that score, and we put it into that composition, which is the foundation of all things. All right, so now that we have the score taken care of, we can take any number and then check to see if it's a score. We now need to think about, well, wait a minute, I'm getting this score off of an object. So this needs to come off of an object somehow, and uh, this, that, and the other. So what we'll do is we'll create this one, and this is a function that takes a number and then takes a record, that's what we're calling these, um, and then we'll give you back what's called a maybe of record. So earlier we talked about either. Now, either is the canonical sum type, but maybe is what's called a specialized sum type. So it's exactly like either in all aspects, except the left side is always fixed to undefined. It's always fixed to a unit. You can never put anything in it. Anything you put into it will automatically map to undefined. So that's the only difference between the two. It's a specialized type. So we're saying it, maybe this is good, um, and if it is good, then we'll give it back to you. If it's not good, well, you get nothing back and everything is just lost. Uh, it sounds very destructive and horrible, but it's really fun and exciting. Um, no, there's a lot of uses for it, as we'll see here. So what we're going to do is create another function called passes with, and on this one we are going to take in a score. Four score and nope. Oh, too early, right? It's too early for Abraham Lincoln jokes. Um, so what we're going to do here is we'll do another composition, and the first thing we want to do is actually pull the um, compose off of this. Um, or not compose, we want to pull score off of this. And do we? No, we don't. What we really want to do is use a function called um, prop satisfies. And what prop satisfies does is it takes in a function um, and a prop or takes in a property name that could be on an object and it takes in a function. And if that property satisfies, huh, get the name now, that predicate, then it will return the whole object is true, right? So it's not just going to pull it off, it's just going to return the whole object um, back to you because that prop was satisfied. So we're going to use prop satisfies here. And with prop satisfies, like I said, that takes a score uh, or the property name, and we're going to pull it off of score. And then on top of that, it's going to take a, a function and that function is going to be valid score. And we're going to fix this to score. Okay. So now we have this passes with function. And let's go ahead and change this to be data.map. And we'll use map here. Now, normally we could just pass this function in, but. Um, the version of node I'm using has since removed the inspect. Uh, does anyone know about the inspect function? Probably why they removed it. Um, but what it would do is anytime you put it in your console, it would return whatever that function was as the display in your console. So uh, what I used to do is on inspect, I would give a string representation of the type and not the methods on the type. But I'm using this new version of Node, and I haven't figured out a way around that yet. So we're going to do something, what I like to call hacky. And uh, we're going to course it into a string, because on top of that, I also implement to string to do the same thing. So if I were to use it inside of a uh, literal or a template literal or whatever the heck this is called. Yeah, I'm a JavaScriptor. Uh, where are these things? Um, so we're going to do passes with, and we're going to say 70 here. And uh, 
Also, we will pass in uh, what I like to call um, x. And then that should put it to string. So you see this is all true, false, true, true, true. So all of these have uh, passed that initial part of passing the score, uh, if we were to look at the data. Um, and we could just by doing what I like to call a log data. Right, so if you look at those records, the ones that um, either haven't passed themselves, uh, like that last one, or the ones that don't have that, they all are false. But if you look at that type, I said I was going to return a maybe of record. So there's one little thing I'm missing here, and there's a function that's called safe. And what safe does is it takes any predicate function, and it's going to run the value on it, and it's going to, if it passes, wrap it in what's called a just, which is the right side of the maybe, or if it doesn't pass, it's going to return a nothing, which is the left side of the maybe. So now, if we look at this, now on, for the first ones and the ones that actually pass, we now have a just and the record that's there. So now we're inside of our maybe, we're feeling good about ourselves, things are going great. And really, that's all we need to validate the score. So that's it. Uh, all of our score validation is good to go. The only thing that's there are things that do our score. So now the next step is we need to pull off. Am I right? Am I right? We need to extract the learner from this. So we'll do the same sort of thing. We're going to start at the lowest level, which would be the string that we're expecting, and then we're going to work our way up. Before I do that, though, does anyone notice anything about line 21? Yes, it can be a composition. Because the same thing is happening. Over here, there's this value that's re ready to take a predicate. And then over here on the right, we have the validate score. And then over there, we have, uh, over here, we have the score being put back in. So it's the same exact thing. And by the way, this type of argument handling is called uh, data last. So if you think about it, everything, or if you were to put the data you want to work on as the very last argument of all of your functions, every other argument before that is context on how to work with your data. So this allows you to actually put these together. And you'll see that there. So I want to run that function validate score, but the context in which I want to run it on is score. So everything before your last argument is the context, and then the last argument is always your data. So, and it makes it easier to change these types of things into, compo into um, compositions. So here we'll just do compose and uh, actually, let's do it like this. Uh, the last thing we want to do is safe. It's the last thing we want. Uh, the mid thing we want to do is prop satisfies. And uh, of course, we want to partially apply that. That's what that's called when you do this. It's called partial application. Uh, we want to put that to score. And the last thing we want to do is valid score. So now we can get rid of that, and we can get rid of score. Notice, so far, the only variables that we're ever working with or creating or anything, they're all functions. We don't even have arguments that come into things. Everything that we're working with is a function. We haven't declared a single variable yet, except for data, which is the data that we're working on. So just something to note. So and if you look, we give it a save and give it a save, and uh, we get the same result because we're not, yeah because we're doing passes with. So now it's just a simple way of making a composition out of this. All right, so now we got the score done. That looks good, hunky-dory. Now we want to move on to the learner stuff. And again, we're going to start at the base level. So the first thing we want to do is actually pull off the user. And the rest of it should go pretty quick before I lose all y'all. We will do validate learner. 
And validate learner, of course, takes a record and then returns a Boolean. So here we're going to, again, go with and. And we want to do, is that what we want to do? Yes, that's what we want to do. Um, so the first thing we'll do is pull that in with and, and we'll do is number or is string, just so we can check that. And then on top of that, the second thing we want to do is check the length. So we're going to do prop satisfies length. And the function that we want to actually pass to this is going to be greater than or equal to four. And that should get us what we want. So if we were to go ahead and map this over, um, we can make this a, uh, a uh, whatchamahoosic composition. But, oh wait, yep, but there's no point. I think y'all get that by now. Uh, so here we're going to do valid learner. And we don't need any of this. It doesn't need to be partially applied. So we see that we do not have a valid learner at all. And that's because I got ahead of myself. Um, we didn't actually pull learner off of it. So it's looking at all the objects. But uh, so for the sake of time, instead of setting that up to do this, we are going to use this function because you notice we have a validate learner, or yeah, validate learner, which as its first argument takes a function that goes from record to Boolean. So since we just implemented a function call that goes from uh, record to Boolean, we'll go ahead and use that. It fits in nicely. It's like I thought about it. Uh, so we'll do validate learner. Validate learner. Now I can't blame it on my mouse pad or my mouse thing. I should have just left that on there. Uh, validate, that's the last one. All right, so with this, we're going to take in our function and we're just going to call this test. Um, the, the reason why we're breaking this out and not putting it in there is if we don't put a function in there and we say take this function, I could then swap that function out for anything that I want to test. Um, so maybe I want to check to see if there's five characters or if uh, it's all capitalized or whatever, it doesn't matter. I can just swap that function out and then get the reusability of pulling a user off and running it against some predicate. Um, uh, okay, so we're going to take a function. We're just going to call that test. And then this is where it gets a little cool, I guess. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is do get prop. And what get prop does, it's kind of the same sort of thing as safe, except I give it a prop name. And if that prop exists, it will give it back to me and adjust. If that prop does not exist, I'll get a nothing back. Again, saying that, hey, something's wrong. There's nothing I can do with this record. So here you go. Good luck to you, pal. Um, so here, we're just going to do our get prop with uh, learner. And uh, we'll just leave it like that for now, you basic. Uh, we'll do validate learner. And for here, we will pass in that little function called valid learner. And here we will pass in x. So now you see that everywhere that there was an actual learner, something that had learner in there, even that one that is a null uh, for that one record, it still came back. Um, because it was defined. We didn't check to see if it was null or anything, but we were able to actually pull that off just by using that get prop function. So the next thing we need to do with this is then do some validation on it. So now that we have it, we can do the same sort of thing. Uh, let's make this read a little better. And we can use safe, but we're going to get an error if we do this which is totally expected. Um, and we're just going to test it with our test function. So 
we get a nothing. Why did we get a nothing? Oh, I know why we got a nothing. So it just went ahead and used that type. We didn't get an error, but it's not giving us the results that we want. Now, the reason for this is these algebraic bits, they can not only uh, you know, map or change themselves, but we can combine the effects of them. So how we do that, uh, some might say we chain the effects of these. So the effect so far that uh, we're, we're starting to see here with maybe is that it implements disjunction. It implements uh, either you have this or you don't have this, right? So I can take that effect, that is the effect of this type. This is where the term algebraic effects come from. I can take that effect and chain it to a, uh, another function that will then reapply its own effect to it. So how we do that is by chain. Now you also might have heard of this as um, flat map. Um, I don't like flat map. Uh, it's, it talks about what it's doing, but it doesn't talk about like, because it maps it and then flattens it. But it doesn't really talk about the power of these and the chaining of the, their effects as they go down. So when you're thinking about an array, flat map makes sense. But when you're thinking about some of these other types, it just doesn't convey like what's actually going on with these. Um, so if I were to chain this, I now get everything back. So that null record uh, where the learner was null is now a nothing. And everything that does not have a name or that has a name that matches our criteria is there. So we took care of the actual validating. Super simple. Now, there's a problem. We have these two separate streams. We have these two things that are going on. So remember earlier when I was talking about the independence of a product type, we're now going to kind of exploit that. Um, so we can think about each one of these values after the function's been ran on them living inside of a pair. So inside that pair, we'll have the results of each. So in uh, Crocs, we have a function called uh, valid record. We have a, uh, a function called fanout. And what fanout does is it's going to take in two functions and it's going to take in one value. And what it's going to do is run that, run that one value over the, le the first function and deposit that inside the left side. And it's going to take that same value and run it on the right function or the second function and deposit that on the right side. So we'll now have the results of both of these in one pair existing independently, all based off of one value. So that's where we get the independence from. So for this, all we have to do is take our validate learner, and we need to take our validate record. But notice, uh, you're silly. Validate score, or valid score? Did I call it passing? I called it pass. Passes with, right? Yeah. So, and then here we just apply that to 70. So we want anything that passes with 70 and we could bring that score in and push it down and things like that, but there's no reason to do all that here. Uh, we can always go back and modify that when we want to. So now we'll just take a little look-see at what we have here. So if I have a valid record, uh, validate or valid record. And I pass in X. No errors, no errors. All right, so you'll see here we have, uh, let me give that another save. You'll see we have a pair, and on the left side, sorry, we have a function which is wrong. Here we need to do a valid learner to apply that. Okay, so now you'll notice on the left side we have everything having to do with the user and on the other side we have everything having to, or with the learner, 
And on the right side, we have everything that has to do with the score, bringing that entire object back. And some of these are just, and some of these are nothing. But remember, we only care if it passes both things. So we really only care where a just appears in both places. And I think there's just two of these, three of these? No, two of Thomas, and he has a score of 72. Oh yeah, so there's three of these. There's three of them that have a just in both places. So just like before, when we were do, what we need to do now is merge these back together. And with these algebraic data types, there's another thing that we can do with them, and that is, uh, we call it the applicative or the apply. We can take and merge these two types together, these two same instances of the type, and not only use their values, but apply their effects. So what that means is if there's a nothing on one and a just on the other, it's gonna be a nothing all the way down. If there's a nothing on the right and a just in the left, that's gonna be a nothing. But if they're both just, then I'll get the just back. And the result of that function will be wrapped in a just. So this way we can take these two separate streams of effects and combine them into one effect. So essentially we've branched and now we have to merge. So there is a function inside of uh, Crocs called merge that takes a pair or takes a binary function, then takes a pair and then applies those values to the binary function. The left gets applied to the first argument and the right gets applied to the second. So that, and that will take two values and put them into one. So we're going to use, uh, what is this? Validate record. And that's going to be a composition of the other thing we want to do is valid record, validate record. And here we want to do merge. Now to get the effects to actually apply, we're going to use another function called lift a2. And uh, the a stands for applicative. But what that means is we're going to take a function and then we're going to lift it inside of the maybe and then apply the values inside the maybe to it. That's why it's called lift. Um, we're gonna lift it into the maybe, apply these values and give another maybe back. Now, we already have the transformation that happened uh, and that happened on the left side. So, because all we really want here is just the username or the learner name, right? So because that's on the left side, we really don't care about the right side at all. Like, who cares? We only had that in there just so we could validate it. So we have uh, what are called combinators or combinators, depending, I've heard it both ways. If you ever watch Psych, no? Anyone heard it both ways? All right. Um, so uh, uh, we have these combinators or combinators that uh, allow you to kind of change how, and compose is one of them. It basically takes functions and allows you to change how you call those functions. So what we're going to do is uh, use one of those called constant. Now, if you're familiar with Ramda or things like that, that is always. And what constant or always does is it's going to take one argument, then it's going to ignore your second argument, and it's always gonna return that first argument again. So that way we get a function that always returns the first thing you pass to it, which is exactly what we need because we don't care about the second argument, we care about the first argument. So we're gonna lift a two on da, 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 constant. And if we come here and do validate record. Is your second argument that they're supposed to be valid record? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Okay. Why did that not work? Validate record takes the compose. Oh, no, it worked. So now you'll see that everywhere that we had it, we have nothing but these just and, you know, just Joan, and then anything that didn't pass both criteria have now become a nothing. But if we go back and look at our requirements, they said nothing. <laughs> about uh, including maybes in it. They want the actual names there. 
Problem is we're in an array, but I got a secret for you. An array, believe it or not, is actually also a sum type. So it's a sum type just like the other ones, except the left side of it is an empty array, and the right side of it is an array that has things in it. Kind of maps very nicely, some might say naturally, to what the um, maybe is. On the left side, it has nothing. On the right side, it has a value. So we should be able to take that natural feel or that natural relationship there and transform an array or a maybe into an array. So, what happened to Bob? Is Bob valid? Bob is not valid because he has uh, three. Okay, yep. Nice. Yep. Bob's not valid. Don't tell him that. We don't want to fix the glitch, if you know what I mean. I'm making too many movie references you guys haven't seen. Yeah. No? Okay. All right, I'll, I'll cool it on those. <laughs> I found the hard way in doing videos, especially when they get in, uh, internationalized, don't make word puns. Word puns don't translate to people that don't speak your language. <laughs> it's something you just learn after complaint, after complaint, after complaint. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. Oh, that's horrible. All right, so now we have this. Um, I'm curious, let's see if it... It did, okay. So by the way, if you notice or have noticed, we actually, I don't know if people mentioned it a lot, but in the newest versions of Node and uh, Chrome, you have flat map on array. So now you can do cool little Haskell things without having to use a library like Crocs. You can just call flat map. Um, they added that uh, without, well, I mean, they told people, but no one really, Thought that was really cool and went on and on about it, at least in my channels anyway. Um, but we're not, we're not going to do that. Um, what we will do though, because it doesn't really match the laws of course, like they just can't seem to get it right. So that should have failed on me because I didn't return an array. I would have to return an array for that to be valid. But JavaScript, they don't do it right. So mathematically, since my function is correct mathematically, we'll go with that one. Um, but really, all we need to do to make this program, and one of the things you'll notice, we started at the lowest level, and we've now worked our way up. Everything that's been validated, every little requirement that was there, we worked on each requirement individually, and then we moved up a level, and then up a level, and up a level until we got to the hole. So instead of going hole down, or top down, we went uh, bottom up and implemented it that way. Uh, so we will do program. And now our new program is just going chain. And remember that natural transformation I was talking about. We can then do maybe or uh, maybe to array. And maybe to array is kind of an odd little sucker. So its first argument will either take a function that returns the type that you're going from, or it'll take an instance of the type you're going from. So that way you can either put in what's called the Kleisley arrow, like these, you can put in a function that returns that, or you can go ahead and just give an instant and immediately flatten it uh, if you need to. Here we're going to use the function portion of it. And all we need to do, program, is put in validate record. And here, all we have to do is do a program and put in our data. And it's done. The only two people we have is Joan and Thomas. I thought there was three, but why is there not three? Because Joey, Joey failed. Joey failed big time. Um, yeah, so there, there's, I mean, that's it. That's uh, how, how to implement this. So there are some drawbacks. Uh, there's a lot of pros to it, but there are some drawbacks and things like that um, that you kind of have to consider when doing this. So why would you even want to do this, right? 
So there's some pros. Uh, number one, we can focus just on the logic and make sure that we have everything put together based on the requirements that we have and not some overreaching requirement. Um, it, it makes it easier to extend. Ah, well, yeah, this goes along with that. So now we can implement each of these requirements in isolation. I started at that one. But I didn't have to start there. I could have started at any requirement and worked on that individual requirement and then later put it all together. So it lets you do stuff in isolation. Also in doing this, it's easier to write specs for. Imagine writing for specs. You would have all these ridiculous specs for the, just those simple like for each ones to account for every case that comes in. Whereas here, I can, a, I can make a spec to the rec. I can make a spec to the rec, and uh, I like that. I'm going to sticker that. Um, and uh, it just makes it easier to test, thing, or at least for doing unit tests. And then your integration tests are basically, did your composition work, right, uh, for that, that part of it. Um, but you can compose small and easy to reason about units of code. Now, what I mean by easy to reason about is, I'm only looking at one small thing. All these compositions, if you look at them, they don't go beyond three. So it's real easy to say, what does this do? Also, each one of these compositions have a name. So once you get used to like, <clears throat> once you get used to what these functions do, um, you can go ahead and uh, uh, just, if you're digging in and trying to find a bug, just by looking at the names of the functions, you should be able to figure out where that bug is happening and what's going on. And you really only need to make small, minute changes, like when you're doing feature extension and stuff, most of the time. There are times where eh, it's not fun, but hey. Yeah, well, I wish. <laughs> um, so again, it's real easy to create new programs. Like now that we have all these little requirements, a lot of times, and you'll notice that the requirements that come from the business, they're the same. A lot of them are the same, but just in a different context. So this allows you to use these small composable units to reuse the same requirements just in different areas because they were built at the atomic level. And also, uh, we only went over two simple aspects of two very simple structures. There are a lot of these out there. Um, well, not a lot. There's a few. There's some uh, between abstract algebra and category theory. There's some pretty cool stuff in there. But a lot of this talks about the underlying uh, driving bits of programming. So it, it's the abstract of like what makes programming programming and why is this true. So as you learn, if you decide to take this route, you'll start to notice these product types everywhere. Um, you'll notice some types and things like that, even though they may not be explicitly called out, you'll start to see that. And if you know their properties, even not doing this declarative style, you'll still know the guarantees that you get from using that type or that structure. And there's many libs out there. There's Ramda, there's Crocs, there's Folktale, there's Flucher. There's a lot of libraries out there that can aid you in doing this sanctuary. Um, there are some cons, like with anything, there's a drawback. So all these compositions you make, you have to maintain them. It's very important that this type goes to this type, this type goes to that type. Most of the time it's not a problem um, because a lot of this stuff, you could take any type A and you know, return a maybe. Like with most of that maybe code, it, it's not that hard. But there's some times where uh, some of your type signatures are going to get out of hand and they need to be maintained. It's just something to be aware of, like with any code. Um, uh, it requires some gazing into the future because you don't want to go in and like choose a pattern uh, like a, an API for what you're doing. Um, you want to be careful about how you choose it because it might be hard to change later on. But the good news is if you, you're not really gazing into the future, you're looking at like, all right, what are the points of variability on this? And that's where like your context and your data comes into play. And it's just a matter of which context goes first, basically. Um, so it's not really gazing into the future of your project, but trying to recognize how things could change over time. Um, there is a lot of indirection. You notice instead of one function, we blew up into eight functions. So a lot of it, uh, while you're digging through code, you have to get used to that indirection. And a lot of like good naming will keep a lot of that jumping, just like Ruby code. If you name things well, 
you don't have to comment and you don't really have to jump because the function, since it's only doing one or two things, it's very easy to come up with a name of what that function is doing. Um, but you do have to get used to that in direction. Yeah. It's just one of the costs of it. Um, also, if you work on a, on a team, your whole team has to buy into this. Uh, you can't, it's like me going, all right, guys, we're doing 6502 assembly. No one's going to go for that. And, but everybody, if we decide that go that way, they have to do the 62, or 6502 assembly. Um, and there is a slight learning curve at first. Uh, Unlike object-oriented programming, um, where it could take a lifetime to master, there's really only a few concepts. Uh, a lot of the concepts are repeated and just at a different level. So there is a slight learning curve at first, but you overcome that pretty quickly. Um, but, and then you'll learn how to not be able to explain a monad. By the way, we used functors and monads and applicatives, like all those things that you might have heard on blogs. We just used all of them right now. I didn't call them out because I didn't want to scare anyone. But everything we were doing was all monads all the time. Like, that, that's what they are. There's nothing scary about them. Um, all right. So we kind of went over. Sorry about that. I'm not going to bring this keyboard next time. Um, and uh, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.